Hello, I'm Julia. Welcome to the Mind Matters panel. George Bernard Shaw told us the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. So, to give us some advice on communicating more effectively with parents, we have clinical psychologist and family therapist Andrew Fuller, Centre for Multicultural Youth Education Support Officer Placid Jayasuriya, school psychologist Sarah Innes, teacher Nerissa Rodriguez, and parent Monique Parlevliet. But first, let's see if the staff at Eagleton can give us any good ideas. Interpersonal communication is a skill, like tennis or juggling. You get better with practice. But some people, like Rob here, aren't all that comfortable trying new things in conversation, which is why we provide direct coaching with these earpieces. It really helps. <laughs> Let's watch Rob and Trisha in action. <laughs> okay, so these are Jackson's parents? Thank you for coming, Mr. and Mrs. Pollock. Oh, please, call me Stella. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Jackson just got a job at the local supermarket. Jackson just got a job at the local supermarket. Yeah, yeah you know, he wanted some independence and some extra money for his art supplies. Yeah. Oh, emphasise the strength. Jackson is very strong. Uh, no, the strength, his dedication to his art. Uh, his dedication to his art is of a great strength. Oh, well, he does love it. I mean, what did you think of the piece he entered into the art show? <sighs> oh. <laughs> Crap. Crap. Oh. He, he won first prize. I think he just kicked me in the heart. He kicked me in the heart. Wouldn't punch me in the bladder. Punched me in the bladder. Yes, 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 <laughs> and isn't that what art is all about? I have to go to the toilet, Rob. You're on your own. Nice work, Trish. Rob's doing really well. What a lovely conversation. Mm. Okay, right, Andrew, can you see the red light? Yeah, okay. Good. Excellent. Yep, yep Roger yep. that. Now smile like the radiant sun. That's the way. Wow, these things are amazing. They really work. Great rubber ducky, let's go. <laughs> Put it away. Come on, that's not what communication really is. Throw that away from $2 shop. Seriously, teachers communicate with students and parents all the time, obviously. Are these skills that need to be developed, Andrew, or are they just magically there? The art of listening is a rare, rare skill. Um, I guess teachers are busy people and, and uh, they do spend a lot of their day talking, which is great except that sometimes when a parent comes up about an issue, one of the things they have to learn, without being too impolite about it, is to shut up and listen, right. rather than rush in and talk. So teachers are very helpful people in my experience. They want to help, they want to sort things out, they want to solve problems. And that's great, but sometimes it's worth saying, you know, dear Mr Green, how can I help? And then... <laughs> Open Say these, nothing. Open these things and close this for a bit. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And hear them. And then, of course, sometimes you'll be dealing with parents who say things that are, sound initially hostile. And again, the initial inclination of a teacher will be to defend her or himself. Try not to do that either. Try to ask, a, if there's something that you're not clear about, ask a clarifying question. So I just I want to understand that. Do you mean this or do you mean that? Give yourself enough space to really hear the concern. And then it's to ask a really, really, really important question, which is, is this something you want me to do something about or is it something you want me to just know about? Now, What's be... the difference? Why is that such an important difference? Well, teachers are amazed often because, they, because they're inclined to rush around and try and sort problems out. They'll be amazed how often parents say, I just want you to know. I just wanted to hear what I'm going through at home in terms of getting Betsy Lou to the school or whatever it might be. So there's nothing, there's no job for them to do. Mm. It's often because parents, sorry, teachers do rush around and try and sort it out that parents sometimes feel a bit railroaded by them. Is that true? <laughs> I, I don't want to um, disparage a very hard-working um, profession, many of whom will be watching this after... Many of whom will be watching. ..from my school. But I do think 
Andrew is right. They, they do want to rush in, they do want to solve problems and, and if it's just enough to take a little bit of the pressure off to know, well, all you need to do is listen and maybe, and maybe offer to share that information with other people who, who, would, be, who would benefit from knowing. And you can offer a, a small, discreet group, not I'm going to email all the teachers of the school this information, but maybe you, can, you would know the direct line that that would follow. When we're talking about these communication skills, aren't teachers taught these skills already? Like, isn't that part of teacher training? No. Definitely not. Well, why not? I don't. I really don't know. It's, it's something you need to pick up by osmosis or something. Well, I, I'm fortunate. I came from a hospitality background. But it is very difficult if you've gone from high school to university to school as a teacher. I actually agree with you. I think hospitality, because I waitressed for a thousand years as well, um, <laughs> it's, you do learn how to read people, mm -hmm. all the other stuff aside. And because you, if I can say, you kind of want to get a tip by the end, you're reading them to go, well, what do I need to do to kind of get what I want by the end of this? But then you started realising you couldn't make assumptions about people. You thought you could. You'd start to actually approach them on a different level. You'd discover a little bit about them throughout an interaction that can last, you know, between one and two hours. And so by the end you become pretty good at reading people and finding out what they want and what they don't want. So how do then teachers get those skills? Oh, there's training available. Um, do they go? Do they go? I don't I know. I, 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 being fortunate within the independent school system, we've got some scope and flexibility and I've been asked occasionally within my school to provide um, some learning around active listening skills. But there are accidental counselling courses around. So that just idea, that idea already gives you the, that maybe you're not meant to be a counsellor, which teachers, we don't want them to be counsellors, but gives you the skills to um, manage a situation with students who might be presenting issues that um, could be a little bit more hairy than you might expect in your typical teaching day. And that's your active listening skills and support skills and being ready to refer on how you do that. that it's, a, it's a pretty decent course. Andrew, what's your take? Let's say if we're dealing with a very fraught conversation between two people, what happens is the amygdala, the part of the brain responsible for fight and flight, gets activated and that essentially blocks the kind of higher order thinking. So if they're kind of feeling fairly heated and a bit fragile and you basically also feel threatened and fragile, then that's two well, dinosaur brains basically talking to one another <laughs> and not much conscious sort of higher order thinking is going to happen. So just realising that's important mm. because, of course, you know, rather than blah, 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 you know, going on and on and on, as, as often when we're under pressure we'll often blab, 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 blab. It's realising that really probably in a stressful duress state, state, you can probably only take in three bits of information, really. And that might be something like, well, it's clear we have an issue, but we also have a common interest, which is, you know, the student's best interest at heart. Would you like me to uh, communicate with other people and look into it and, and how soon... Would you like me to get back to you about that? And, and probably that's about it. Yeah. What about parents you don't like or have nothing in common with, Placid? What can happen there? We have all different, you know, all sorts all coming sorts. with all different, Everyone does, different, yeah. different issues. So, but I think they, uh, we sort of probably go from a, a strength-based approach. So we're looking for, for positives, you mm. know, the fact that they are coming and talking to me or talking to our services or, or for the school, that's, that's a positive, you know. Can we use it, you know, again, to sort of come back to that relationship, uh, working with, um, you know, the communication, sometimes uh, not understanding, empath the, you know, not quite understanding where they're coming from. I think uh, sometimes you can be speaking English and English and no one knows what's going on. I mean, it's what you were saying then. It's like, oh, the language may not be there, but the language is there and you're still not hearing anything I'm saying. You know, it's that kind of active listening as well. You were nodding, Sarah. Mm -hmm. You agree? Um, yeah, I think... Um, I think that perhaps that we have got difficult people. You, you've got to try and find anywhere in life. You've got to be able to find a way that you can have a working relationship. And often parents, when they're difficult, it's because they're anxious, um, or they just really have no clue what's going on at home. They might be dealing with their own issues that we don't know about. They're not ready to share with us, or will ever share with us. And allowing them to have their say and their voice for a little bit can can help alleviate a lot of the anxiety that might come up in difficult conversations. Hmm. What do you do if a conversation doesn't go well? I think it's important to think 
too, that we, we can't always be perfect and get these things right. I beg your pardon. I know. I know. You to be perfect. <laughs> but uh, it's true. It's good. No, but it's true. Yeah. It's very I difficult. Think it's, I think if you approach it thinking that um, you have to get it right, it makes it harder when it doesn't go the way that you expect it's going to go. And frequently I'll have conversations that deviate from where I actually thought it was going to be and I'm off somewhere else. So, And that's in a more pleasant conversation. So when it's a more difficult conversation, just I think accepting that perhaps... It's not your fault that sometimes these things happen and maybe that opportunity to, to debrief, take a step back, but also to think, well, what can I learn from this? What actually went well, first of all, but then how can I learn from this conversation for next time? Because you're going to have many conversations with parents in the future where the risk is that it could go south and you're not... And so it's helping you for that next time. Yeah. What type of interpersonal or communication skills are important for teachers when they're interacting with parents. What did you find, Mon? Especially when Ashley was diagnosed with depression in, in Year 10 and you had to change schools, what would you have liked more of? So we met on a one-to-one -one basis, obviously, because we were enrolling Ash at a different time, but um, they took the time to speak to us, to hear us and Ash. Um, and I think what really struck me is that by the end of that first session, Ash felt so comfortable, she actually told them about her mental health issues. So that was without prompting from us, that was without, you know, us going, look, we really think it's advisable that they know. It was actually a case of her going, I want you to know mm. that I have depression. Mm. How much impact can just one conversation actually have? Look, I think uh, it can have a great impact on their settlement process. You know, often parents are looking to get their children settled mm. in their schooling. So if everything's going well... It's just one building block and getting into the next thing. That's right. And, and I think having those difficult conversations, um, it's, I think it's important that for teachers that if, if, if they get caught off guard, that they can stop and, and not have it to continue on and making, making time. Um, because if the parent may be not, not ready to have that conversation either. So you may, you may want to make time, stop, make time for, uh, to have that conversation. So you can stop. That's true. The mm. idea that you have to go, oh, well, we booked this 15 minutes, I better do something, and then going, actually, this won't actually lead to anything and we need to kind of set something uh, that's better. And that takes a boldness, mm. doesn't mm. it, to do that and a, a courage. One, one conversation can have a lot of an, a big impact? Oh, a great conversation can change your life. I think a, a conversation where you're truly heard, where you're truly seen, where you're truly acknowledged is a, is a magical thing. It's almost like, um, it's like dropping a pebble into the pond of your life and it resonates, it has echoes. And we know that from our research on resilience, that basically it's when a teacher or an adult outside a kid's family says, you're all right, you're the kind of kid I like, there's something about you I can see that no, nobody else can see and that you can't even see about yourself. That, that changes mm. that child's life. Or when a parent says that to a child, the same thing occurs. And when adults recognise the humanity of other people and kind of really acknowledge that, yep, it is tough. <laughs> it's, I don't know what to do about it either, but gee, it's tough and well, I'm going to look into it and kind of see if we can get this kind of sorted. That really forms that bond that changes people's lives. Thinking deliberately about our conversations can be exhausting. I know, because comedian Jared Kintz once said, I consider conversations with people to be mind exercises, but I don't want to pull a muscle, so I stretch a lot. That's why I'm constantly either rolling my eyes or yawning. <laughs>